Don't say it. <laughs> Dan, would you shut the door, please? Thank you. We're live. Hey, good morning. Today is Friday, January 27th. Amazing, the month is almost over. Um, it's 8.30 a.m. and we are uh, continuing our work um, to uh, uh, meet and greet the people who help uh, this state do its energy work. And today, we're uh, um, here walk with us from the Fishing Vermont that we've been working this month. One of the models I've talked about regularly is the Fishing Vermont and Vermont. Um, the power of uh, Vermont coming together and investing in a program that has helped them save a lot of money as well as reduce environmental impact. So I don't want to say anything more than that and just turn it over to Mr. Walk. So good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you again. Good morning. For the record, Peter Walk, Managing Director of Christians in Vermont. I'm joined today by Dan Riley, who is now Senior Public Affairs Director. Senior Director for Government Affairs. At VIC, which is our parent organization. Uh, Dan, uh, you may know, uh, has been promoted into more of a nationally focused role as we look to support other states and other entities trying to achieve the, the, the missions that we all care about as well. So um, Dan uh, joins me today to provide me with the factual backup for the things that I am a, a little new on still. Um, this is my eighth month, I believe, of, of this role. Uh, look forward to being here with all of you. It's nice to see new members around the table, and it's nice to be here with old members who I've spent many an hour with over the course of the past few years. We call the old members uh, a lot. <laughs> Senior. <laughs> Seniors feels a little too close to home. Oh. <laughs> uh, I will, uh, if Jude, can I share my screen? Yes. Right. I'm your co-host. Perfect. All right. Uh, could we see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to put that in the full screen mode so that it's a little easier to see. That actually is ugly. Uh, all right. <laughs> oh, either is fine. I will adjust. What's that? I did not break out. Okay, so I guess so. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're so kind. I'm not sure where my scroll bar went here. It's not going all the way to the top. Anyway, anyways, I'm going to roll with it here. So, uh, as we guys don't need my introductory slide, you know who I am, Peter Walk. A um, little bit about who Efficiency Vermont is. We are the uh, the state's statewide energy efficiency utility, and there's an asterisk next to that for reason, which I'll talk about. Uh, we help Vermonters transition to more affordable, low carbon energy use through education incentive support for the clean energy workforce, um, and we're a US EPA Energy Star partner. The asterisk is there because um, the, we, we share the energy efficiency utility responsibilities with BGS and BED. Um, so uh, BGS handles the thermal efficiency work in their territory, and BED handles uh, Burlington's uh, uh, work. So I just wanted to sort of make sure that was clear. We use the term statewide because we are available <laughs> statewide, not because we are responsible for every component uh, and every geographic region of the state. Um, in Burlington, does, it, does EBT play a role in Burlington as well? We, we work in close partnership with both of the other energy efficiency utilities. Uh, we, you know, so for something like the Act 151 work where we're supporting dealerships on, you know, on helping you know, them get ready for the EV transition, that is in, in detailed partnership. We, we make sure, you know, just there's detailed accounting for all this, that we're all accounting for who's getting credit for those savings claims uh, in a detailed fashion. But it's partnership is sort of key to all that we do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Um, we, you know, the, the, the general public thinks a lot about energy efficiency and efficiency Vermont as the provision of incentives to help them achieve their own personal energy. <coughs> that is a, a component of what we do, and it's the largest component of our budget, but it is a component. The technical assistance we provide, the work that we're doing with supply chain partners, 
contractors, with education, one-on-one -on -one guidance to homeowners and businesses, uh, that directs some technical support to businesses who are trying to work through complex problems. Uh, that is all critical and part and parcel to the entire program. The incentives are ultimately what sort of make it pencil out for a business or for a homeowner, but they wouldn't have gotten there without the other components along the way. So it's an important reminder that, that the work goes beyond simply putting passive incentives out into the world and hoping that people take them up on because this transition is complicated for everybody. Uh, and so we need to make sure that uh, we are we're working through the whole thing. Can I ask a quick question on that one? Yep. Um, remember years ago when heat pumps were a newish thing yep. that one of the things that I think Efficiency Vermont did was guarantee that if a wholesaler stopped them and didn't sell them, you would repurchase them or something because they were afraid to hold inventory that might never sell. So you, it was like helping the supply chain feel confident enough to become supply chain. Do you still play roles like that? We do. Whether that that's a specific one, I would have to get back to you on because it's before my time. But the the roles that we play, we we do a lot of that work with supply chain partners to make sure that that technology is available in Vermont. Vermont is doing very well in, in terms of heat pump insulation relative to partners. And a huge part of that is the work that we do all together in this sort of energy ecosystem to make sure that there are heat pumps available and the right technology and the people to install them. I know you heard from Mark Stevenson from, uh, from Vermont Energy earlier this session, and he's you know, a great example of somebody who's really leaned in, worked with Mitsubishi to make sure that he has it, and really worked on the apprenticeship side model to make sure that he's got the workforce to do it as well. So they're great examples of those kind of partnerships across the board. Um, this is a good sort of snapshot. I know you had questions on uh, from seeing notes from your conversations that uh, on you know sort of the the value of the program as a whole. Um, because I don't have my uh, my notes in front of me. Because they're part of the PowerPoint slide notes, um, I believe the overall investment up through 2021 was uh, roughly 869 million dollars, somewhere in there, somewhere in the 800 million dollar range, with a return on investment of over three billion dollars in economic value, lifetime savings for the state of Vermont. Give me the number. 880. Give us that. 880 million dollars of total collected EEC of energy efficiency charge, effectively. And to a return of three billion dollars of lifetime value. So it's a it's been a strong return. Um, we've had an, an impact on lifetime greenhouse gas savings. While that hasn't been our particularized goal, it has resulted in that in that sort of value. Um, one of the things that we talk about is as rate pressures are going up in other states. We our value to the Vermont electric system is to be in partnership with the distribution utilities to keep the overall bill costs lower, uh, to make sure that there that people need less electricity and therefore we can keep the overall cost lower. So looking at uh, so you see that bottom left hand corner, uh, thirty six percent lower piece is sort of a key piece of of that we talk about. People, you know, the energy efficiency charge is is a clear sort of component of your electric bill and while that is you know it is is easy and it's upfront the avoided costs that we've helped produce help to you know balance that out and ultimately make it a positive economic return for the state of Vermont. You know one of our challenges lately has been that people are pointing sort of not in your case but the thinking you're using is pointing only at the upper left hand box so the in yep. as opposed to the Five other boxes that yep. out there. And and and, and uh, to be clear, efficiency of Vermont was a was is set up to be an understanding that that investment in efficiency, and it is an investment, so their revenue generated to make those investments is worth it. For and in this case, it was for an economic reason and for the need not to build out more generation. But there are other you know other values at play as well. Um, so right now, if, if efficiency didn't exist, I like to think of that 15.1 number is that if efficiency didn't, Vermont didn't exist in the efficiency programs that the EU has run altogether, Vermont would need 15% more electricity roughly, right? So we are essentially supplying 15% of the electricity. 
Um, and I know there was a question about the relative cost between new generation and um, and our what what the kilowatt hour uh, you know, cost is. So the most recent math is we come in at roughly three quarters the cost of new electric generation. So it's and still, still cheaper to save. And significantly cheaper than new, uh, you know, fuel, you know, on the thermal side. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to put in a little bit of a sort of, you know, how we work, how we do our work, because I thought it might be helpful to you in sort of understanding as you're thinking about larger policy issues. We, the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, oversees a long term 10 and 20 year forecast for energy efficiency. Um, we look at model, we develop models and forecast trends to try to understand where those savings are going to come from. You know, if we're, so you'll see over time the value of lighting has significantly decreased. That's because lighting standards are increasing. And so therefore the, the savings value above code or above standards are going to decrease. So we monitor where those things have come from. We think about it over time. So we develop our three-year demand resources plan, which is essentially our budget and plan for how we're going to meet these targets to in line with that sort of reasonably available uh, energy efficiency work. Uh, that and then we have a thermal component where we take revenues from the regional greenhouse gas initiative auction sales and the forward capacity market revenue generation and combine those together to run thermal programs for uh, for Vermont Vermonters and Vermont businesses and that a lot of that goes into weatherization and other other thermal savings measures over the course of time but that's sort of a, a snapshot of we, we understand what's out there in terms of trends and, and forecasts. We develop a plan to beat that. There's a lot of back and forth with different stakeholders at the PUC, with the Department of Public Service, and then ultimately they approve our three-year man resources plan and we go out and carry that out. So we're in the middle of that right now. The the demand, the 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 2024 to 2026 demand resources plan was developed through most of 2022. We did extensive stakeholder outreach um, to try to understand what people's interests were. So submitted that plan in December. We are now in the middle of uh, you know, answering some, some questions from different stakeholders, uh, and then we'll get into sort of the formal PUC process moving forward. But that is for 2020, 2024 to 2026. So you kind of get the sense of like this, it takes a while to like make sure that we have everything right to go forward and develop the plan and then to carry that out in a stable, consistent fashion. So I think one thing I hear, I'm guessing everyone in the legislature here in some time or another, uh, we've been running a business in Vermont for 20 something years. So like, hey, haven't we done everything we could do? It's like time to stop. Sure. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The answer is all of the sort of the resource acquisition, which is what we, the fancy name we call for achieving energy savings is getting more expensive. Some of that is the low hanging fruit are gone. Some of that is we're in an incredible inflationary environment and a challenging uh, uh, you know, situation with like how goods and services are moving around the world and in the middle of you know coming out of a pandemic. And so those things are all more expensive. That's to, needless to say, we are obligated through our plan. We have a commitment to achieve a benefit to cost ratio of greater than 1.2, meaning the return on that investment is greater than 120% of what the cost of our services are. And we we don't get comp we don't get the sort of the compensation that we would normally get without achieving that measure. And we haven't hit that point yet. It's, it is getting more challenging to achieve those savings, but it's still important. You know, it's still a good economic value at this point. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bright. Uh, I think you're going to have a little more information on this in the future of your presentation. But one of the challenges seems to be that the folks who are most uh, the most vulnerable Vermonters, the people we're trying to support the most, tend to have some of the highest energy burdens, but in fact, some of the hardest times actually reducing 
their use of electricity or their energy overall. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how great that cost is to get at those savings compared to what might have traditionally been what you were doing to get energy savings. Sure, uh, I t tend to be fairly blunt. Um, so I hope you appreciate this, but I, I think we, we were formed and we exist to be a cost effective energy efficiency model that has over time, we have added in low income goals and other things along those nature, but it is not the primary driver of the work that we do. And as I spoke to that 1.2 ratio, the, it, it is the, what, what our experience is, is the, the, the need to, to go in deep with a homeowner to understand what their, what their housing needs are to get all together. And a lot of that is not an energy necessary. It might be a roof. It might be vermiculite in their you know, existing insulation. It might be not into wiring. I may be speaking about my own house, <laughs> but that's you know, just sort of life as we know it in Vermont's housing stock. It's not that you can immediately transition to a weather station project or racing farm. There are a lot of steps along the way. And we're we're really excited. We just got a congressionally directed spending um, from Leahy as he was leaving, and the governor put some more money into it in his budget called the Clean Heat Homes Initiative, where we would work with BGS and the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and their wrap program to, to provide kind of wraparound services, pun intended, to uh to homeowners where we would really Get, get in deep and understand what those needs are, electric panel upgrades, vermiculite remediation, all those things to sort of be a one-stop shop. And that's complicated and hard and costs a lot more money. And so we have to be very careful if we if we pursue lots of those programs, we, we are still held accountable to that ratio. And so we then need to go hunting for whales uh, for large energy savings projects elsewhere. Thank you. The, the interesting environment right now is that without the incoming cannabis market, we would be in a, we would have had a much harder year in terms of eating energy savings. We had the largest energy savings project we've ever had with an indoor growing facility in this past year, because it is a very energy intensive industry. That that you know so 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 that there, there are a lot of you know every time we get into this there's a new emerging technology there's a new emerging industry that needs our support and because we're here we can help to make that possible uh, anyways got a little off track but but i wanted to give you a little sense and so then then one of the one of the oh yes uh, i just wanted to clarify 1.2 ratio so yep. Um, that's a ratio of dollars, or it's ratio of energy. It's of dollars, and there okay. it's 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 sort of the benefit is calculated via avoided cost, and the expense is essentially all of the all of our all of our budget to include the 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 money that goes to the public service department to make sure that they have the ability to oversee us and all those. Things. So uh, there's a lot there. The other piece that it, that it that isn't on this slide that's really important is the while the, our budget and how we achieve the plan and the actual energy efficiency charge are related, it is not a direct one-to-one -one relationship because it is applied to the volume of electricity sales to then meet the budget. So that fluctuates up and down. So for 2023, the rates, generally speaking, are mostly going down. There's a couple of instances where that's not the case, but we can already start to see based on based on a two years past sales number. So we understand that for 2024, it's likely to fluctuate again. And we tried to sort of blend those rates a little bit so there isn't as much of an impact. That I just wanted to be clear that though it's not like our budget goes up and the EEC goes up and meet, like there is a, there's an intervening factor in there as well. Right. Um, going to the budget quickly, go back to that slide where I showed you all of the things that are necessary components. This is really where that comes in. That 50% number, that 50% budget is for of our budget it goes out in incentives. Um, but there are a lot of other pieces, the technical assistance, the support uh, for uh, contractors and other things and other program costs that really are those, that training and education, that support uh, through our uh, energy or efficiency excellence network, the EEN, where we work with contractors to help them, uh, to help them be able to support the work that we need them to do, right? It's a great partnership. Um, 
uh, because we all have interest in making it work. Are you planning, um, you know, certainly happy to wait to, um, to talk a little bit about the Energy Efficiency Modernization Act, where that fits yes. to this whole yeah. portfolio for that? I, I am indeed. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so I wanted to, those, those are the kind of big picture things. I'm going to blow through some of these slides a little bit quickly because I want to get to some of the questions that I know that you'll have. Again, this is just a reminder of all those things and how they fit to the budget. Uh, this is the, like, if I only had one slide to put up and I know it's, it feels a little hokey, but we do everything in partnership and that hasn't always been the case. And I really appreciate the, uh, the way our partners have leaned in with us to, to solve some of these hard challenges because um, the the construct could lead to a lot of competition and unnecessary mm -hmm. infight. And through partnerships, we're able to go further, we're able to do more together, we're able to reach more Vermonters and have more impact. So we work with a ton of different folks to make sure that we're out there every day. And we're not all, we're not always we we you know sometimes fall down as any communication and, and whatnot happens, but Really appreciate the partnerships that are out there that we work through every day to try to make this stuff work. Uh, as we talked about, the Efficiency Excellent Network is our is our contractor network. Um, it is we we help you know they end up being the action arm for say a weatherization project. Um, if you want to get an incentive through, um, you can come find a find a pro or a retailer on our website. Go through that process. We, we support them through trainings and other things. We hold two conferences every, major conferences every year to update skills and provide more information both for contractors and then again for some of our largest business customers to understand what their, what their you know, colleagues are doing out there in the world and ideas that might be out there for them. Uh, so the, 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 Energy, the Efficiency Excellent Network is, is, a, is a great way in which we take what our is the incentive budget and maximize its potential to make sure that that we we have the the, the trained ready contractors ready to go to do it that connection with the customer and um the, just the sort of ongoing updating skills and other things we we are relying on our contractors and so we try to make it valuable for them to be part of the efficiency excellence network and uh move forward so while we're on that one can I ask? Yeah. Um, so one of the <clears throat> constant concerns is, do we have the ability to achieve the outcomes we're after, uh, given Vermont's current workforce? And we're always looking at growing that workforce, <clears throat> increase the volume of work sort of across the board on energy. What's your, what's been going on in your network, and do you have that workforce concern? Uh, or if you're going to get to that later? Short answer is, is yes. Um, I do have that concern. I think everybody has that concern. The scale of change we are talking about is not at the current pace. And many of our contractors, as we did, did some surveying work this fall, many of them are already scheduling three to 10 months out, right, on the current volume of projects. That is a question of whether or not they have the, the, re, the both the capital equipment and the people to be able to do that work. And what we have often heard is, you know, incentives are still a, probably the primary factor for many Vermonters in taking on this. Program. Without a stable and growing to the scale that it needs to be set of incentives, a business is not going to make the investment in capital equipment, right? That was the problem with the era funding in 2008, 2009 was that they got burned because they bought a bunch of capital equipment, trained a bunch of people, and then once the federal dollars ran out, there was nothing there to support them in that work and help Vermonters keep working. Um, and so they're, they're, they're rightfully wary of that investment. And there's just, people are, are re you know, the workforce has reprioritized other things through the pandemic. And we, you know, we are we are going to continue to need to work on that. You have made some investments that we we're a part of um, that are important, but that is the the a stable business model to meet the demand is a key component of of whether or not that. Can. And now, did, did you just say that we spend a lot of money helping to train people how to do weatherization or efficiency work, yep. and they're now out 
doing a different employee than other jobs now. Yes. Okay. Right. In in 2008, 2009, there was the, with the air funding, there was a ton of investment in training and capital equipment to support the work. But ultimately, in the end of the day, the the state support to that work was only so much, and it it so it needed to kind of retreat back to the sort of the previous level of workforce and whatnot. And, and so people were left. They did what they took yeah. other jobs for. Yeah. The they left, they left and, and, the business, jobs. and the businesses, yeah. the businesses were burned in the process, right? So it, right. So so stability is key. Yeah. Let's, let's keep moving. Um, so we do a ton of education and, and promotion and outreach for around the state, all over the place. Uh, we did, I, you know, I will admit that we did have to remove uh, one of your colleagues from several of these slides because <laughs> In a former world, Senator White was one of our community folks out there doing this great work. It's really important talking to people, answer questions. I got to do an event um, in November that was, you know, the questions that people have are fascinating because there's nobody, it's hard to know who to talk to about just basic things. And people learn how to make, you know, really simple little changes that they hadn't been thinking about, or they start the process with somebody they trust so that they can get the ball rolling on a much larger project. But it is, it's intimidating. It's a lot, you know, the, the, the systems are complex. It's not just like replace compliance and move on with our lives. It's a lot of capital equipment. It's a lot of disruption in your home. It's a lot of any number of things. And so being there, being focused, being out there talking and providing basic education is really important. Uh, we are out every day thinking about how do we work with small uh, grocery stores and you know and uh, country stores about how we how they uh, more efficiently cool the, the food they have in their stores. Right? The the leakage from uh, refrigerant systems is a huge driver in emissions and and a major source of energy waste for these small businesses. You know, they need support and assistance. They don't have the, the wherewithal to go out and hire their own, you know, many of them don't have the wherewithal to hire their own engineer to go through all this work. So our ability to get, sit down with them and talk through what they're seeing, what they need, what time they have, what capacity they have to sort of be project managers for this work is really important. Um, and we're able, and those relationships get that get founded um, from small businesses to big businesses is really important because you have a trusted ally to be able to help you work through these challenging problems. You have a lot of group of repeat customers. Oh, yes. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, one of the cool things that happened during, I know this has been a topic, the Clean Heat Homes is a sort of example of how we go, you know, go deeper folks, but during the pandemic, one of the things that was really helpful, obviously people were wary about having anybody into their home. Oh, yeah. Um, and the virtual home energy visit was born where you could sign up, do a you know sort of Zoom or FaceTime walk through of your home with one of our energy advisors, thinking about our energy consultants, thinking about how you know what options you have. And it you know was it perfect? No, I mean it's a bit like a virtual uh, health visit versus a you know physical exam. There are certain things you're not going to get, but it helped people move down the path towards starting to make some investments or changes in how they did things. And so people really valued it. We weren't trying to sell them on anything. That's part of the value of being a third party <coughs> is we're not, we don't, you know, we don't sell things. We work through others to provide services. Um, and, <coughs> and then we have in 2022, we received 21,000 calls to our customer service. And those could be five minute calls or they could be an hour. Right, and we have trained energy advisors who are ready to help answer a, a lot of questions uh, along the way to help make this one. So, when the when an energy coaching visit is over, besides knowing what options are out there, you help people prioritize the spending and know the cost of all those options. As, as much as we can, it it does. You know that that's. That, that probably that next step in some of those cases we need an energy audit so that you could do the detailed sort of cost of savings piece uh, well with blower door testing of things to get but it it is 
for, for many people, and I could think about my own experience, the energy audit was a bit overwhelming because you get a lot of information all at once and it's you know big numbers and it's intense. Starting more on the, here are the things to think about, here's the path, help, would, help, would have helped me along the way to know sort of what I needed to prioritize around. Um, I want to go quickly through our thermal programs. It's obviously an area of interest for this. We we do we use TEPF dollars, the Thermal Energy and Process Fuels Fund, which is the Reggie and the FCM revenue generation, not a not a charge on anybody's bill in any form, um, to provide weatherization services, to provide thermal efficiency services to to businesses and other things. Um, we do that in a number of different ways. We try to make it try to have sort of different steps along the way. There's a DIY weatherization program where you can get money back for doing simple things that you can do yourself. Um, we work with free thermal uh, very closely, uh, arm of capstone to, to do uh, low income multifamily retrofits is a great program. Um, we and then the bulk of our work is uh, through the efficiency excellence network through our contractors to do a home performance with Energy Star, which is the primary whether it's a program, primary incentive program. Um, and then we work, we we try to inform when we when we meet with a customer who would qualify for the OEO programs, we try to help them understand that there are no cost solutions available to them as well to help make that kind of entire network work. How do you know if they qualify for an OEO There, uh, so there are, there are a number of things along the, along the way where we, you know, where we can do that. We do work with, uh, we contract with uh, third parties um, like a Opportunities Credit Union to help us to have them do that evaluation of, of income for us um, because we do home energy loans as well that can be income sensitive. Uh, that that is a challenge, and I think it's a challenge across the board. You're going to hear some from Dan next week about the IRA bill, and there's a lot of challenges in there uh, because the federal government would love to be to have incentives be available at the point of purchase, and point of purchase income sensitivity is really hard. <laughs> um, unless you accept that most of the time people are going to be relatively honest <clears throat> at the, the, like, the auditing function and the work to, to verify may or may not be fundamental. So there's a lot of factors in there and it's something that everybody sort of with. But you know, I know there are partners like in the housing community, we talked about this with Laura Collins the other day, who they do it all the time and it's not a big deal. We don't do it as often. And so it's a little more, you know, it's just, it's our, we don't have the muscle memory. Um, but we are, right now we have partnered with BGS to offer up to 75% of weatherization costs, up to believe five thousand dollars. And we're, as we get into more of the ARPA weatherization discussion in a moment, we're gonna we're working to try to increase that that dollar figure even more. Uh, this is a bit of a uh, sort of trend line of where we're going. It's been a, a little bit fluctuated over over the course of time, but with things coming online like the ARPA dollars and the and wrap and other things we're hoping to be able to do more. Um, you've probably heard from us in the past on the likelihood of a significant decline in the forward capacity market revenue, which would lead to lower, you know, revenue to be able to spend on weatherization over time. That has been offset at the moment by higher than normal Reggie prices. And but we do still anticipate eventually the FCM market not um, not producing as much as it has previously. Uh, Want to talk a little bit about heat pumps? This is the annual uptake in in cold climate heat pumps. Right, starting in 2015 with only 1,300 to now 2022, we saw 10 almost 11,000 in a year. Um, this is a great. This is one of the great stories of collaboration between us and the, the utilities and the contractors and the supply chain, right? We work very closely with, you know, the, the incentive that goes to a heat pump, it's typically applied before you even see it on the price tag so that there's a stable market for the, so we get a bill from, from FW Web rather than an individualized application for a heat pump. 
it's a very efficient system. It makes sure that the prices are low, that people can see that up front, that they're not having to do the math in their brain about what the incentive gets things down to. Um, and, you know, there's value for us from a, a from a, uh, from a thermal and, and, and electricity savings, and there's value on the tier three side for the utilities. So we work really closely with them to make that happen. Um, is that related to <clears throat> tier three, the tier three program? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so that that's where they, they get to claim savings to their, you know, or claim, yeah, claim the energy savings or the greenhouse gas savings in tier three yeah. for the heat pump installation. So we work, we partner, believe we partner with most of the utilities around the state to make that. Um, Here's a quick forecast. This, I will say, does not include any of the investment from the Inflation Reduction Act. But interestingly, you're, we're going to start to see at the end of this decade, people replacing the existing heat pumps, right? Right now, we're in a model where you are transitioning from one heating system or augmenting a heating system with a heat pump. And we're going to start to see some of it for replacement. So the numbers will be more stable, ultimately, such as we get with Regular, normal, you know, as we know it normally. Uh, this is where I'm going to start talking a little bit about the Act 151 work. As a quick reminder, in 2020, you passed the Energy Efficiency Modernization Act, which became Act 151, which allowed uh, the energy efficiency utilities to spend a portion of their budget on uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions programs. Um, we, this is one I'm incredibly proud of the partnership and collaboration that happened. We often talk about, you know, what happens after somebody has had one of the state uh, OEO run weatherization activities done. What happens, you know, what happens to them is their follow up, is their waste. This is this amazing follow up program where we, we, we get the list of people recently weatherized from OEO partner, you know, reach out to them, partner with the utilities, find ways to match so that we can provide them with a no cost heat pump. Right? To help them start to make that full transition in their energy use and not simply have their existing system be more efficient under a weather addition. It is a great wraparound piece. It is challenging under the cost effectiveness approach of our that, that i mentioned previously under our current work we could do it but we'd have to balance it with other things and so this is a way for us to really get in and focus and it it has it didn't launch until this fall because we had to work through several things and there was a pandemic um but we are already oversubscribed and working with the du's to see if they want to do more um and, and reallocate some of our budget towards this program Sure. What, um, I was just going to ask what funds this project. So that is that is a portion of our budget that we have dedicated through uh, an update to the DRP, the Demand Research Plan, that provides money to go to uh, to these projects. Okay. And so, so it is within our it. existing. It's not new. It's not separate. Um, it is a component of our budget that we have we have proposed. Um, so the Act 151 uh, is is due to sunset at the end of 2023. Um, we uh, think it has been a successful program and we're happy to talk to you going further about what that could look like. There's the bill, I could pull it out of my pocket. Because <laughs> you know that program originated here. I think we're gonna lean into helping it continue to go. Uh, and and the same space we worked, we and this has been where the majority of our Act 151 budget has gone to, is to supporting the market as a whole to sell and maintain and be able to support the transition to electric vehicles. Um, the Act 151 was very clear that we didn't want to get into the the tier three savings claim space. So our work has really been more in the sort of soft um, side of the market transition, working with the dealers to um, help them install charging infrastructure, to train sales staff, to incentivize the sale of electric vehicles. Because while they're, they're the state and the utilities and others have provided you know, tax credit, federal tax credits 
those are coming you know, back in a bigger way under IRA are very helpful. Dollars alone are not sufficient to make them. And if we're gonna have the small businesses in our communities able to work on people's cars and that sell them vehicles, there they need support to be able to, to make this transition. Ford, I should say Ford, the, the, the original equipment manufacturers, the main sort of uh, car manufacturers are need to make this transition right through the clean, you know, clean cars rule, and clean cars do rule. <laughs> they need to get more vehicles on the roads. Dealing dealing with a bunch of small dealers is a challenge for them, and so they don't care whether those businesses exist as long as cars are being sold in Vermont. But we do. They're part of the fabric of our community. They, you know, they're a huge part of of how people engage in the transportation space. And so we we really enjoyed supporting them. We're, we're interested in doing more. Uh, they're having a meeting coming up next week. I'm looking forward to hearing feedback from them on how the program is working, how the marketing is working, trying to get the information out there. Uh, so can I just sort of uh, check my way of talking to other people about this? Part of it, uh, when we started this pilot, was because the state had failed to step up their a major transportation fuels or heating fuels program. We, it was, we were sort of uh, stymied in a way. And this was like, okay, one day we will do that. And how do we start to get ready? How do we get experience on the field, figure out how it works? And you all have been, I think it was just like, you know, pioneers sent out ahead of a bigger migration. And and those the conditions of the larger policy change has not yet come to pass, um, and so there is still significant value in continuing to do this work and to meet um, to meet the need that's out there. Right. Even there's another bill we're working on. We're not talking about today, but uh, it's not online until 2026. So still. Three years off, so we're in a pilot phase. And and most importantly, we're not we're not just working with you know not, not most importantly, but importantly, we're not just working with new dealers. We're also talking about used car uh, dealers as well because that is the fabric. Like you know, we think about EVs as being new vehicles. Ultimately, the you know the conversation is about how we have a stable source of used EVs in this state because most people. I don't, know, I don't know what the numbers are. I should, Seventy-three percent of uh, automobiles registered in the state of Vermont are registered as used cars. Thank you, Senator McDonald. But right, so that market has to be robust for us to actually meet the significant reduction requirements associated with the global warming solutions. All right, I. You've heard us talk in the past about our energy burden report. That is effectively the total cost of somebody's energy procurement, electricity, transportation fuels, heating fuels, relative to their income. And what we see is in many instances, transportation tends to be the highest burden of those. Um, and in many cases, that's because we are a rural state where you need to drive long distances to get things. Um, electricity tends to be the smallest component of that. Um, you see the the area in and around Chittenden County. Some of that is income standards. Some of that is the relatively inexpensive nature of natural gas relative to other heating sources. Uh, but we are working on an update to that now. The, the, as we're always trying to update the way in which we do the calculations to provide more value and to help think through the questions, the inevitable questions that come to that. And we're still working through that now and hope to have something uh, done here at the beginning, early part of this year. But it is the the relative points and the challenges that face from previous versions of the four are still equally as valid. And Kelly, um, will be next week. So we'll here. Uh, we'll spend uh, time on that. So I, I don't think I gave Senator White's answer as much uh, attention as I would have liked. Um, equity is a huge focus for us, right? And I think um, that we are not currently adequately meeting the needs of all Vermonters, because as we talked about, we are looking for 
to be as cost effective as possible. And that is often in conflict with the need to service people who ha have more challenges accessing our programs. So one of a couple of things we've done, we've done, er, we've picked uh, communities to to focus on to really dig deep with stakeholders on to understand what uh, the needs are. And I'll be very honest, we we met with five families in Winooski. We had done all of you know, sort of the appropriate homework, got everything ready to go, had translation services ready to go, had all of the things that we thought we needed, right? Had had good partners in the community to help help understand. And in every instance, they were unable to access our programs. And it had little to do with the need and our ability to support. There are lots of other complicating factors along the way. So if we're gonna do if 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 we're going to achieve the reduction requirements that are necessary in the Global Warming Solutions Act and our energy, other energy goals and comprehensive energy plan and other things. You know, I often, you know, putting on my previous hat, you know, I talked about emissions reductions as you know, the globe, the, the atmosphere doesn't care where the emissions reductions come from. But the people who spend their money and their their and deal with their comfort and their lives on the energy that's used that produces those emissions sure do care. And so we need to think about if you're if if we're going to reach the goals, you can't simply rely on low hanging fruit and market based solution mark market sort of rate solutions for all these things. You have to be able to dig deep and help uh, our our friends and neighbors who uh, need. Uh, more assistance and more coaching and more, you know, the time and capacity to be able to do these things. How does that figure into your, I mean, do you have that metric 1 to 1.2 yep. drive things? Um, so we, so in our, we are really, in, in our forthcoming BRP, we really try to think about one of the things, you know, it, working with Nooski was eye-opening because we we thought we were ready. Clearly, we didn't know what we didn't know, um, and so what part of our uh, demand research plan is really getting out, doing public engagement, and understanding what it how what people need to take on the the work that we collectively are asking them to do, um, and to really meet that need. That that is a clear area of of weakness. Um, across the system, but certainly with us too. Um, we are thinking about how do we measure success. We are a very data-driven organization. We have a, a bunch of different uh, goals in front of us that we are required to meet or that we strive to meet or get as close as possible to meeting. And the, the primary one we use right now on the equity side is a spending requirement. That's inadequate because we could spend a lot of money on one family, and we meet that spending requirement. That doesn't that doesn't meet the need where it is. So there's a lot of thinking and work. I, the partnership with the public service department has been really good on this. This is an area of focus for them. A huge part of that in the 2022 comprehensive energy plan. But how we do it is complicated and hard, and just needs us to recognize that and to keep working on those things. Uh, <laughs> We are doing, we are, you know, I think the Clean Heat Homes program is a great example of leveraging one-time funds to try to understand what people need so we can think about programming moving forward that is more stable and, and more doing. So we don't have that cliff that we talked about with the RO funds. Uh, but it's, it's not an easy conversation, but it starts with a consistent level of commitment that that is a necessary component of the transition. That it's not an extra thing, or it's not a let's carve out a small component of the budget to make sure we do that. It's a critically important off the top. Well, it's great to hear you talk about that and appreciate it. And we know we have some programs that are sort of purely passionately driven like flight. And 
Passionately driven? Yeah. We don't want people to be cold at home. <laughs> yes. um, and then we have programs that are driven by a metric like 1.2, 1, 1. when you have to reuse kilowatts. Um, so they're different beasts. And it, it's great that even though you're under that other metric, that you're figuring out ways to. We, we always try to you know create a little space for creativity. Um, but yeah, it is. It, yeah, you're, you're talking about the difference between a, a system that was set up as a social service versus one that was set up to be a, you know, we, we exist because we're cost effective, right? If we weren't cost effective, the model never would have moved forward. Then we it's cost effectively driven, not compassionately driven. We have a life oil dealers do everything they can to not have us use light heat money to weatherize. They want us to buy fuel with light heat money. And they find reasons to push us to buy fuel. I think that's all we do with light heat money. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's a there are some, some swaps around within OEO that make some of the weatherization possible, but it, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to touch. <laughs> I have knowledge that it's not helpful in this context. Um, the uh, I wanted to anchor a little bit around. You all have trusted us in recent years with significant investment that we then put on the ground in support of Vermonters. Uh, this uh, this slide doesn't include the. Um, the initial CARES Act funding, which I believe was $29 million for 15. So uh, 29 total for school indoor air quality. The initial 14 was about that sort of emergency <coughs> assistance during the pandemic, helping schools stay open and survive, right? Um, now we we're running a program to get deeper into mechanical ventilation and other things with the partnership with the agency of education. You initially proposed a, a tranche of $5 million for low and moderate income weather efficient. Um, now we are, you know, you have then added $35 million on top of that. Um, that we have been working closely with Public Service Department on, on making sure that we are ready to do that. As you have heard from everybody, the ARPA money is complicated. And when Treasury comes out with final guidance that it's different from the initial guidance midstream, you know, made sure we had to dot our T's and cross our I's. Uh, so that we can make sure that the federal government doesn't try to claw that money back. Um, but we're going to get ready to roll, hopefully get a grant agreement in place with the department and get that money starting to roll out for Q3 of 2023. So we're going to have, it's going to be a short period of time to spend it, but we're excited about it. We're excited about the opportunity. It ties in great with the cleaning homes and other programs to be able to just make a big push uh, in the next few years. Um, there, we there. You've made investment in workforce development, as I talked about, um, and, and there are some other dollars flowing through OEO that we're trying to work in partnership with. There's a lot of need there. Um, the Switch and Save program, which is about sort of uh, appliance switch out, we've worked with some of those dollars. And then there's this big unknown. We include that in here, not that you have made that investment yet, or that the Department of Public Service has determined that. Uh, the, the efficiency Vermont is going to play a role, but because it's on the horizon and it's there, and it's something you should be thinking about. Um, there, this is the sort of rebate total amount, not necessarily the full amount that could be available to Vermonters, because tax credits are going to play a huge role in this, and that is a bit of an unknown, right? But it, you know. It, uh, just because we don't know who's going to apply for that. But this, this is money the state will have uh, some level of control over. My um, counsel, uh, Dan is your expert. He's going to go through some more detail on this next week. Um, he knows this better than anybody. But like anything with lots of is past kind of last, you know, last minute, it came together. We're, we're happy that it came together. And there's a lot of work going on about how, do, how does it actually work? And so I know it, 
patience isn't necessarily this building's strongest virtue, uh, but I would ask you to be patient and let some of those things play out so we don't end up in conflict with federal debts. Uh, Who's providing the guidance in this case? So, depend, so for the rebate dollars, it will be the Department of Energy. But that's, I think you heard probably from more cons or others, there's the greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is going through EPA, and there's, there's a lot. <laughs> so it is not flowing stably through one place. This is our version of a cliffhanger for anyone watching today. If we come back on Tuesday, Dan will be talking about that. Yeah. So Dan, Dan is our, Dan is, Dan is, Probably knows this better than anybody in the state of Vermont. Oh. <laughs> so he's getting into all of your questions. <laughs> um, but that that includes my slides. I know that was a lot, but I figured it would be helpful to go through them in, in depth and kind of talk through all the stuff that's happening for you. Thanks very much for the the tour. It's always to me always impressive how much how many things are going on at Efficiency Vermont that. Uh, we're not aware of that helps get ready to do even more. So, uh, committee, we have a couple more minutes before we're on to our next guest. So, fire away with questions. I can't imagine we don't have questions. Can I ask the question I've asked for the last three days to various witnesses? Is it about Maine? <laughs> what might that be, Mr. Chair? I don't think that's the, the efficient to Vermont question. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead. Why, why does Maine have the lowest electric rates in New England? Is it because they are smarter than us, luckier than us, or is it some divine intervention? <laughs> <laughs> Normally that comes in the form of a written note, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I, I have not done a detailed analysis of, of Maine's rates. Um, ultimately, where we get where our value comes in is to the, the size of the average bill, uh, which we have helped keep Vermont's bills low. But certainly, I if you have, I'm assuming you've asked this question to the Department of but, Public Service. Uh, like the night yet, but ICE, we asked the ICE only yesterday and, and others, and basically, don't get back to us on this question. I, 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 I would have to tell you the same thing. Thanks. <laughs> Um, are you a are you a vermiculite victim? I am. I I recently I am a home remodeler myself uh, in my spare time in my own home, and I pulled out, broke down a bathroom, got got down to the last board, and found four inches of vermiculite sitting in the bottom of the stud base, and forty five hundred dollars worth of remediation later, and I have no vermiculite until I found knob and tube all through the floor. <laughs> I was days away from signing my contract with, for uh, weatherization and heat pumps and stuff with, uh, I guess, capstone. And they said, well, we got to hold off because we're having a meeting about the regulate and then ban. I'm thrown out in the backyard in the snow. There, I mean, we, you know, regulate gets kind of lumped into a number of sort of health and safety concerns within a home. Right. A lot easier for if it lumped, but it doesn't. It just <laughs> dribbles. Yeah. So you know, mine you know clearly trickled down from somewhere, yeah. and likely was in the sort of attic at some point. Now my attic is finished, and no, there's blown in insulation in the attic. Don't know what else is in there in the floorboards. Yeah. So sometimes the the best the like the the response from your average homeowner is to go, I just need to not open that door and go in that room for a while so that I can, until I can formulate a plan. Formulating a plan is hard because you don't know where to start, what the costs are without sort of ripping everything apart, you know, getting everybody out of your house for six months. Ms. Phillips told us last year that they were, um, I'm not sure how they were getting this flexibility, but they were trying to have uh, run the OEO programs such a way that they didn't put off uh, home like theirs, that they were able to bring more money in so that once they were taking them out, they would do what was ever necessary, even if it wasn't necessary weatherization. So it could be vermiculite, it could be a leaky roof. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, that's, that is, 
that is a huge factor. When you think about moisture as a huge issue and the process of a leaky roof gets uh, it's an equally as challenging problem. I, I, I think that they were able to have some of that flexibility under the ARPA appropriation that you gave them that allowed for some focus on other things. Uh, there's also been support over the years through the Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity, which I have been on the board of, uh, that has provided money to a state agency to do the things that they cannot afford to do because the funding streams don't allow it. So last question to you, Senator Watson. I realize that we don't have a lot of time, but I, uh, I'm interested in your version or take on the origin story of Efficiency for Vermont. And I realize that could be a long story, and I, so, but maybe we don't have time for the whole thing, but. Uh, um, neither Dan or I were around for that origin story, obviously. <laughs> um, I would be ha would be happy to, to to sort of provide some more details on that, but it is it was a you know it was a lengthy process trying to understand it. It started out, um, yeah. There there was a, a lot of iterations along the way to get to the point where we see the program as it exists now. So it did not happen overnight. Yeah. It wasn't clean. There were a lot, you know, yeah. and there were many iterations um, that have gotten us where we're today and. You know, because of that, there's a lot of you know we there's a lot of sort of extra stuff that goes along with it because you know sort of you tend to grow and to take on more stuff and more you know oversight and all those things that don't necessarily relate to the current program, but exist from the past. So, uh, needless to say, as you think about programs in the thermal sector, the it is not a there's no light switch for this one. There's no, you can't create a program overnight. It doesn't, it, it's not possible. People can't respond to deliver on the ground at people's homes overnight. So time is an important factor to work through complicated details. So Thank you. Um, one thing, uh, an offer uh, is that I've heard over the years that this is Vermont now such a mature organization that there may be uh, an unproductive level of reporting and oversight in your operations, and that maybe given the maturity of the organization, uh, we could it could still be operated in a very fiscally prudent manner, but it might be a more streamlined process to do that. So if that's something you all are interested in discussing, then. I'd like to sort of pencil that in to our calendar later this year. I'd like to give the PUC some credit for that. They do that kind of update on a regular basis. Certainly, I, I think that is a, a, a factor. We do lots of great reporting that it's that was that has as things have become more stable and sort of people are uh, you know are comfortable with processes when not things take on lesser value over the course of time. I don't know if we have a we need a solution from you all at this point. I think we're comfortable with that partnership. It's going to take some work on our part to understand what we think, you know, has value relative to the effort um, funded. But I appreciate that offer. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we're the government. We're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Walk. Good to see you again. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. Thanks. So we're not, our next guest is remote, uh, and uh, just to bring blood work, uh, I'm hearing next from uh, Jared Ulmer at the Department of Health. Good morning, Mr. Ulmer. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so we're getting a little set up here on slides and all that. So I think this is maybe the fifth or sixth year that we've had Department of Health in and uh, we wanted to uh, just review again the, the health. When we first started talking to you all, someone said, well, why would you have Department of Health in when you guys are actually running something like a weatherization program? And um, the reason back in the beginning was we really wanted to understand the impact on health of making these sorts of investments in people's homes. And so uh, we have two new members on the committee. So let's we'll make sure that they've heard your testimony and that I know that you folks are working in 
all the time. So love to hear about you know any new information you have since we last talked, which I think might be two years ago. So great. Thank thank you so much for that um, intro and appreciate you all accommodating. Uh, my, my virtual testimony today, I have um, toddler duties on Friday mornings that make it um, impossible for me to get to Montpelier by 9.30. Um, but thank you for having me. Um, and yes, I'm very happy to, to give some updates on some things that we're working on. Um, I, I don't think you expected and I don't plan to comment specifically on, on S5, but to oh. accomplish what, what you suggested, which is just to, to share um, some health considerations that we think about related to, to home energy and um, hopefully can help, can help add some richness to your conversations. Um, and just for introduction, I'm Jared Ulmer. I manage the climate and health program at the Department of Health. And I've been in this role since 2015. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the program, I kind of work in two areas. One is on um, identifying and trying to respond to expected health impacts of climate change in Vermont. And a lot of that right now is focused on preparing for hot weather events. And the other part of our work is, is kind of what we're more what we're talking about today. Um, how, how can we support health and equity through appropriate climate mitigation strategies? Um, I'll actually touch on both of those a little bit today, but, but more so on the, the climate mitigation side. Great. Thank you. And yes, um, we weren't our, our request for uh, testimony today doesn't include uh, any requests for commentary on affordable heat acts. So just want to thank you. you. Already said it. I just want to confirm. Thank you. So, sorry, I, I couldn't quite understand that. I said, we thank you, and we we are not looking to ask okay. you to on S five. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, are you ready for me to go ahead? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, so I, I like to start with my key points and, and takeaways, um, and then I'll, I'll circle back and add some more detail on these. But some of the key health considerations that I wanted to, to address today, um, the first one I won't go into a lot of detail about, but it's sort of foundational to everything that, that we're doing these days at the health department, which is acknowledging that equity and affordability is really um, fundamental um, in this conversation um, to, to make sure that everybody who needs, uh, especially people that need assistance, have the resources they need to stay sufficiently warm or cool. It's just such a, a fund, fundamental concern for, for health promotion. Um, the next three points, I'm gonna have a few slides each on those and I, I can pause um, after each section for questions or happy to take questions throughout, but um, the, the main points that I want to talk about today, um, number two is that home weatherization is such a win-win for health. I'll go into a lot more detail about that. Um, three, that reducing home heating emission, emissions is great for health, whether that's from weatherization or other energy strategies, um, and that's especially relevant for reducing emissions from biomass, um, another topic I'll go into more. And then the last one is, is more related to the climate impacts on health, which is that we're realizing that Vermont homes really need <laughs> to start adapting to hot weather as well. Um, a lot of this weatherization and, and, uh, and thermal conversation has been on um, home heating, understandably, um, but we're starting to see more and more impacts in, in summer, especially related to the, the lack of cooling um, installed in Vermont. So I, I wanted to share a couple of points about that. Um, so starting with home weatherization, like I said, it's it's a win, 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 win for us, at least five wins, there's probably more. Um, and these I'll go into to more detail on, but um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions helps avoid climate impacts on health. Um, improving fuel affordability, saving money is always good for health. I'll go into some more detail on that. Improving occupant health is one of the areas that we've really focused in, in trying to identify ways that weatherization benefits the residents' um, health directly. Um, improving air quality, I'll go into much more detail on about how those weatherization projects actually provide benefits for all of Vermont through outdoor air quality improvements. Um, and then that last point about, um, uh, in addition to improving uh, 
in energy efficiency during the winter, we really need to start thinking about um, cooling considerations for Vermont homes as well. I think that last bullet is a new one for us since okay. last conversation. Okay, great. Yeah, I thought I thought that might be. Um, and I'll go into more detail on that, but a lot of that is because there have been some, some really impactful heat events in states with similar climates to Vermont in recent years, and we're learning a lot of lessons from that. So something I was hoping to bring to your attention today. Um, but starting with weatherization, um, we know that a lot of, a lot of folks seek weatherization um, because of uh, the, the potential financial savings um, in addition to improving, you know, comfort in their home, um, we we know that from state weatherization data, many homes save twenty to thirty percent um, in energy costs following weatherization, and we consider that a health benefit um, in large part because we know that some of those some of those dollars saved end up being spent on health promotion. Um, our partners at NeighborWorks of Western Vermont have shared some really great survey data from some of their customers um, who have stated explicitly some of the different ways that they've they've used their savings to support their health, including um, being able to buy health insurance that they couldn't afford before or getting to doctor's appointments, paying off medical expenses that they had a hard time paying for or purchasing healthy foods. And there's a lot of evidence from around the country of how these um, dollar savings from energy tra do translate directly into health benefits. That's a um, quick question on that one. Sure. Um, have you come across any data related to weatherization and home comfort as it relates to mental health? You know, that it, I, my experience is that it is stressful to live in an uncomfortable home. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'll, I can go into this a little bit more in a few slides, um, but there, there's quite a bit of evidence about, um, as, as you said, sort of, there's there's stress involved with living in uh, a, an uncomfortable home that you can't keep warm. Um, there's financial stress with paying the energy bills. There's social stress often with um, being in close quarters. In a lot of homes, some rooms may get closed off during the winter um, because it's too expensive to heat. So it sort of um, uh, concentrates the social stress into smaller space in the house. Um, a, a lot of folks struggle with um, wanting to have visitors come when their their house isn't, um, you know, feeling <laughs> very welcoming, and in, in part due to the the thermal condition. So there is a lot of evidence to to support that um, that that there are mental health benefits related to all those factors following weatherization. Thank you. Sure. Um, and in addition to some of those concerns, um, we know that, again, from NeighborWorks of Western Vermont data, a lot of the, the customers that they've served um, before weatherization, they've asked about other health impacts they've experienced in their home, some of which might be related to home conditions, not necessarily all of them, but about a third of their customers report having some kind of breathing issues or allergic reactions um, when they're in the home, um, reporting chronic headaches, um, tripping and falling in the house. So we know that there are a lot of different conditions in the in the home that affect our health every day. And we spend a lot of time at home, especially now. Um, so that got us really interested in, in doing a little bit more research on um, different ways that weatherization can benefit health and trying to answer some of the questions like the one you just asked Senator, Senator Bray about uh, mental health. So this is some information I've shared with you all before. Um, this is from some research we did a few years back trying to synthesize um, published evidence from all over the country about health benefits of weatherization. Um, and on the left, you can kind of see the different ways that we found weatherization can improve the home environment from saving money to improving comfort, improving air quality and moisture conditions that help reduce mold. And then on the right, you can see all the different health conditions that link to those um, from the evidence, um, including the ones that we just talked about, mental health, financial stress, social health. These are more or less ordered in what we consider the strength of evidence. So the ones at the top, there's better support in the scientific literature for general health improvements. And that's just sort of overall physical condition. A lot of that relates to the thermal conditions in the home. 
Um, I mentioned social health, upper respiratory, sort of nose and throat conditions. Um, and then there's more of a moderate level of evidence to support benefits of home weatherization for reducing asthma symptoms, reducing cardiovascular issues, a few of those others we've already talked about. And then there's a small amount of evidence about some other um, benefits like reducing injuries um, and, and some, some other infectious diseases and neurological conditions. All of this is documented in a lot more detail on our website. I'm happy to, sh to share that um, link later. One of the things we learned, heard about um, in prior years was that, uh, and I just want to make sure, I don't know if you have an update or you can just validate that these stories I've heard are actually accurate. One was, I think, based on the Rutland Regional Medical Center. I think there was another one up in the Northwest, uh, in Newport maybe, uh, where there were um, individuals who were making repeated trips back to the hospital for I think it was respiratory problems and, and hospital visits are very expensive and that when they looked into it it was conditions at the at home that they thought were causing these relapses so there was medical money applied to uh, home weatherization and indoor air quality improvements that it was a medical investment to help that person stay healthy and it turned out to be cost effective to do that um, so one of I want to make sure those stories that I'm remembering them right. And two, are you seeing uh, programs like Medicare and Medicaid or other uh, government health programs starting to quote unquote prescribe um, something like our weatherization program to, for the health benefits? Um, yes and yes, you're teeing me up very nicely. <laughs> um, we did, we did, uh, you did describe that experience pretty accurately. There have been these, these un unfortunately somewhat small and short lived pilot projects around the state that have provided um, weatherization and some sort of add on health um, interventions in the home for um, people experiencing poorly controlled asthma or COPD. Um, for, for some older adults or people with disabilities or maybe just coming off of an injury that, that had some mobility challenges in the home. Um, so those are the types of projects that have been worked on over the years. There hasn't been a lot of great comprehensive assessment. I mean, the, the small amount of data that's, that has been provided does show um, some, some nice return on investment, but from small scale projects, it's kind of hard to um, to have a, a ton of confidence in that information, but we're starting to see more of these types of projects around the country that once they start to stack on each other, then we get more and more confidence in the benefits. Um, California is doing a lot of work in the space, Washington, North Carolina, New York. Um, there are a number of other states that are doing similar projects and sort of building more uh, evidence in support of this. Um, and you, you may have heard we're working with um, Public Service and uh, an OEO and, and other non-state partners right now on a new pilot project to, to answer this exact question of um, what sort of um, return on investment can we get by putting money into weatherization and some some home improvements um, specifically focused in, in this pilot project on um, kids with poorly controlled asthma that do repeatedly end up in the in the ER um, because of those conditions, um, which may be made worse by the by the um, conditions in the home. So some of what, in addition to weatherization provide, like weatherization by itself provides benefits, improving air quality and reducing mold, but then some of the add-on um, part of the project will be um, possibly removing old carpets because that's such a, a, an allergen source um, and putting down hard surface floors instead um, providing some household cleaning supplies and, and sort of dust management um, supplies like um, dust covers for, for pillows and, and mattresses, um, doing some enhanced ventilation, for example. There's, there's, it's kind of custom to each home, but um, there's a lot of add-on activities that can be paired with weatherization in a really cost-effective way um, and add, add value to, to these general benefits that I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, targeting those to, to the people that we think are going to really benefit most from those add-on services. Well, thanks so much. Um, and 
I'm you know, mindful of time. We can go past and into our break to finish your presentation, but I think we'll have to see us be able to loop back and say, is the, are there any things we can be doing uh, as a committee who sometimes I think of as, we have a deep interest in health and it's health writ, writ large, inside and outside. And um, we can, if we can do things to support that work, I'd love to learn more. Uh, Senator White. Thank you, Chairman Bray. Um, one of the area, areas that I learned about where there seems to be a gap in funding is where they're so vermiculite that's something that from my understanding we do have funding to address but that would come from there's a special fund or pot of money from the vermiculite mines or the producer and stop me if i'm wrong but then there are some homes that don't qualify for that funding and then they can't get weatherization for the free services because the cost to remediate that first bit of work is can often be in the thousands of dollars so there's a gap there have you is this an accurate concern and do you feel that there's ways that it can be addressed is that something because that is very common in windsor county for people to have that issue okay um, un unfortunately, how you described it is about my level of understanding. We do have a, a separate program at the health department that focuses more specifically on on that topic and remediating, um, you know, lead, asbestos, vermiculite in the home. Um, so I'd probably refer your question to them or to the, the state weatherization program, which certainly deals with this, um, you know, on the ground on a lot of the projects. Thank you. Uh, let's wait. turn it back over to you again with your presentation. Okay, great. Um, I'll probably just speed through these next through because I think we've already covered a lot of the, the points through our conversation. But um, as part of that assessment, um, we did try to, to monetize some of the health related benefits. Um, and at the time, I think weatherization, this is 2018, weatherization cost per house was about $8,500. I, I know it's gone up since then, but at the time we found that health related benefits were about three times um, the value um, over over ten, the, the following 10 years um, in relation to that initial investment in, in the weatherization project. Some of this was just from the in-pocket in savings from, um, from reduced energy costs. Some of it was the was related to these health related benefits for <coughs> the occupants of the home related to reduced asthma symptoms and reduced cold stress and reduced heat stress. We couldn't really quantify that entire range of health impacts that I mentioned. Um, it was just a level of complexity that we couldn't get to. Um, but we one of the surprising things we found was that actually a lot of the monetizable health benefit was related to outdoor air pollution and um, reducing emissions from the home, providing such population-wide benefits um, outside of the home, um, that that provided a really significant benefit. And I'm going to go into more detail in the next section about reducing, <clears throat> reducing emissions from the home. Um, the one other point I wanted to make here is that, as I mentioned, we were a little limited in what we could quantify in terms of health benefits, but right now we're actually working with partners, um, with OEO and partners at um, Department of Vermont Health Access to, to look at um, how um, Medicaid claims and costs have changed over time for, for people receiving weatherization services. So hopefully about this time next year, if I were to come back, um, we would have some, some updated information here that would be a lot more comprehensive and Vermont specific than what we estimated in this previous report. Um, so just a, a teaser for later. Um, and then weatherization plus health, I think I've mostly already talked through this, that there's a lot of, there are a lot of different ways that we can add value to weatherization in uh, combined into similar projects. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just move on to my next section, starting on um, reducing heating emissions, unless uh, there are any other questions about weatherization before I move on. Uh, let's, let's keep going, thank you. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to go quickly through here. Um, so just again, to acknowledge that whether it's from weatherization or other, other home strategies, um, reducing emissions from any fuel combustion is good for health. It's especially good to reduce emissions from, from biomass combustion. And I'll get into some of the details on why. 
Um, I won't linger here, but just to list out some of the different health related emissions that we pay attention to. Particulate matter is what I'm gonna talk the most about that has the most, um, most short-term impact on health. And that's basically all the, the tiny solid and liquid particles that, um, that are basically emitted as part of the combustion process. Um, there are different gases like carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, all these are respiratory irritants don't have quite as much of an impact as the particulate matter in the short term, but they're still uh, of concern. Um, hazardous, hazardous air contaminants, and I listed a bunch of different categories, those are a, a bit more concerning in terms of um, increasing car uh, cancer risks. Um, and then greenhouse gases I listed on here don't really have much short-term health impact, um, but that's certainly of concern for longer term um, uh, impacts on climate change and then uh, the, the health impacts related to that. Um, I, you know, maybe we've, I'm not sure we have time and we didn't ask for information on this, but I think um, maybe you can touch on it. Maybe we schedule uh, additional testimony, but I think for the gases and hazardous air contaminants, uh, it would be, I think, uh, helpful and of interest to the committee to know what fuels are the sources of those different types of uh, irritants? Um, I, I'm glad you asked. I thought it was the next slide, mm -hmm. which is gonna be perfect, but it's two slides from now. Um, so, so maybe I'll just make this quick point before answering the, the, this question, which is basically to acknowledge that there's, there's no safe level of air pollution. Um, we do have relatively clean air in Vermont and it's, it's fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of evidence out there that basically says, even if you have clean air, if you can make it a little bit cleaner, that provides about the same benefit as if you have really bad air and you make it a little bit cleaner. Um, so just to say, um, I, I don't wanna use our relatively clean air as a, as a reason not to address air, air pollution. It's great that we have clean air, but we can always do better. Um, to answer your other questions, Senator Bray, I did list out some of these um, primary um, uh, pollutants from emissions um, by fuel source. Sorry, this is a really busy slide. I'll just kind of walk through what one of these um, for an example. Uh, particulate matter being the one that, uh, that is most impactful is the first bar. And the blue section at the bottom is the amount of particulate matter in Vermont that is emitted um, as a result of residential wood burning. There's a little purple sliver above that that's related to oil. And then you can't really even see above that, there's kind of a light gray sliver related to um, natural gas and, and propane. Um, so just to emphasize that most of the residential emissions of particulate matter come from, from mm -hmm. biomass. Um, a little bit, and I just for comparison, I provided some other bars for um, all non all, all emissions from non-residential buildings. Um, in orange, green is um, on-road vehicles, and then blue is non-road equipment, which could include everything from recreational vehicles to construction equipment. And then there's a lot that goes into the other category, and I'll just mention on PM 2.5 because that, that's fine particulate matter. Um, has a big other category, mostly related to unpaved road dust in Vermont that gets resuspended every time we drive down an unpaved road. Um, but this, the story across the board is basically, you know, carbon monoxide, um, residential biomass is again, sort of the main contributor for residential fuels. Sulfur dioxide has a little bit of a different story because there's a lot of sulfur dioxide emissions from oil. Um, so that's the, the predominant um, source for oil. And then residential fuels aren't a main source of nitrogen oxides. Um, that's mostly coming from some of the other non-residential sources. Does that answer the question you were asking? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, just to provide a little bit more detail on where fine particulates come from in terms of heating fuel types, there's a really wide spectrum of particulate emissions depending on the fuel source where uncontrolled things like a fireplace or older wood stoves that were put online before EPA started certifying wood stoves generate a lot more emissions than anything um, beyond the EPA certification era, which I think was around 1990. 
Um, but basically all of the, the wood burning um, uh, heating sources generate m much more particulate matter than, than oil or gas, unfortunately. Even the, the most modern wood boilers, there isn't great evidence on here, which is why I've sort of ins tried to insert it in here. This is a little bit of an older graphic and the best evidence I can find shows that the, the modern uh, sort of whole house wood boilers um, generate particulate emissions somewhere between pellet stoves and oil furnaces, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and then just to emphasize that that uh, we can still even do better than oil and gas, electric, at least at the home, generates no emissions. Um, upstream, it depends on the fuel sources used for electric generation, which again in Vermont is, is mostly emissions free. Um, and then we can take all this information and translate it into estimated health costs. Um, so this really helps emphasize where the areas of opportunity are for, for health benefits in Vermont. Um, this uses an EPA tool called the Co-Benefits Risk Assessment Model, where I can plug in um, information about all the different um, types of emissions from, from categories of fuels in Vermont today and do sort of a what if of like, what if we took them all away? what would the benefit be? Um, and so I'm kind of uh, uh, demonstrating that this here as the, what is the cost to us today um, related to these different fuels? And most of the, the health costs um, in the residential areas related again to, to biomass um, with much smaller amounts related to oil and propane and natural gas. And if I had put an electric you know, line on here, it would just be at, at zero. Um, and related to these health costs, and these are in the millions of dollars, um, we know from this model that it, it estimates about, um, I think 10, about 10 to, to 25 um, people in Vermont die prematurely as a result of air pollution, uh, residential emissions, uh, uh, air pollution in, in Vermont. And most of that again is related to biomass. Um, I think this answers your other question, Senator Bray, about um, some of the, the toxic air pollutions, pollutants. Um, this is probably too much detail to go into right now, but um, Vermont's total air tox estimated air toxic cancer risk is 19 cancers per, um, per million people in Vermont. Um, and there's a variety of different sources from that. I'm focusing in on the about five cancers related to direct emissions from human activity, since that's what we have the most direct control over. And of that, about half of that cancer risk comes from residential wood combustion. Um, I didn't break all the other fuels out because it's that small point one um, in the, the chart on the right. That's from all other residential fuels and non-residential fuels. So, um, you know, the takeaway here is that Vermont has a very low for the, for the United States has a very low um, air toxic cancer risk. Um, so with that caveat, um, most of what we can control is related to residential wood combustion and to a lesser extent from, from on-road vehicles and, and on-road equipment and a few other sources. Okay. What, what are secondary form pollutants? Um, this gets to the level of complexity that I would probably defer to, uh, to our colleagues at Department of Environmental Conservation, but um, essentially, they're, they're pollutants that form by secondary um, reaction, chemical reactions in the air. So they're not emitted directly, but after emitting um, uh, from our homes and our cars and all the biological emissions that happen just from trees, um, chemical reactions that occur in the air form new chemicals, um, and those can be um, can be carcinogens. That's about all the level of detail I could say about that. Um, I could come back with more um, following the meeting if, if of interest. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right, and that, that was my last slide on the emissions and I just have a few slides on um, the, the cooling needs for Vermont. So I don't know how much time you have left but I'll pause here to see if there's any questions and make sure we still have time to get into that last section. Um, if we could try to wrap up in like the next five minutes or so, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I could just keep flying through this. This is fairly, very quick, but sobering. Um, 
I, I mentioned we've we've been learning a lot in the last couple of years from especially from this uh, event that happened in 2021 in the Pacific Northwest in Western Canada uh, that was described in the news as the heat dome. Um, the, the data here, just to summarize quickly, is just to show that in summer, at least, or you know, early summer, um, can the, the climate in, in the Pacific Northwest is very similar to Vermont. It's, it's relatively cool. Um, of course, they don't have as cold of, of winters there, but by May, June, were pretty similar um, to this region. And they experienced just off the charts um, heat, heat conditions for um, a multi-day period there that was you know, 20 plus degrees um, warmer than, than usual, got up to 35 more degrees warmer than usual in some places. Um, air conditioning prevalence is also not very high in this part of the country. Um, so there were, there were really severe impacts, unfortunately. Um, this just quickly shows some of the data from um, home measurements. The black line is outdoor temperatures. The blue line shows homes that are air conditioned and their temperatures sort of just chugged along where they, where they always do in this comfort zone around 70 degrees. But for the homes that didn't have air conditioning, that's the red line. Those homes um, got up to over hundred degrees during the peak of the heat event and stayed 90 or above um, for multiple days in a row and for Older adults, people with underlying health conditions, that puts so much stress on the body um, that it it can and and was fatal um, in in this part of the country. Um, there was a really uh, in depth analysis that was was conducted by the coroner in British Columbia on 619 deaths that occurred during that that heat wave that they identified as being heat related. And what was really shocking is that 98% of those occurred inside of somebody's resident, place of residence. Um, very few happened outside. And you can kind of see the distribution here of the, the types of places where people died during this heat wave. A lot of them were in private residences. Um, in, in total, there were about 1400 people estimated that died during this, this heat dome event. Um, I put some of the totals from the different states and provinces, and just by doing some quick math, we estimated that if a heat event like that happened here and we experienced a similar mortality rate, it would relate, it would result in about 50 deaths uh, of, of Vermonters, which would be a pretty shocking number for us. Um, and we have experienced on a much smaller scale, similar um, similar impacts here. Um, in 2018, we had a, a heat wave that was bad for us. It wasn't quite heat dome bad, um, but for, for five days, I think we were at um, 90 or above, and four Vermonters died during that heat wave. They all died in their homes. Um, this is a, uh, just an article um, commenting on one of them where when uh, responders went into the home, the indoor temperature was 115 degrees, which is clearly not, not livable. Um, so, uh, as I said, very, very sobering, but this is um, what we expect to see more in the future uh, as a result of, of climate change, greater likelihood of seeing these extreme heat events. Um, so, in, in addition to thinking about um, energy efficiency during the winter and keeping you know, people safely warm, um, being absolutely critical, um, I just wanted to introduce the idea that we also need to start thinking about um, how some of these programs can maybe also um, help support safe cooling strategies um, during the summer, whether that's cooling in the home or um, cooled shelter spaces or um, social services. There's a lot of neat social programs that provide wellness checks and, and support to, to uh, especially to people who live alone, um, that can help prevent some of these deaths. Um, that's something that we're focusing a lot on now um, at the health department is, is how to help our, our partners prepare um, to avoid the kind of consequences that they experienced in the, the Pacific Northwest. Um, just recapping my, my key points, and uh, that's my last slide. So happy to take other questions if you still have time. Great. Well, thanks so much for um, going through some familiar data as well as all the additional work you and your colleagues are doing to look at the climate change impacts, which I, I had not seen or heard those kinds of numbers, like a heat dome event in Vermont would uh, could produce an 
you know, 50 deaths, which is uh, kind of a shocking number, really. It also makes me think about when we talk about cold climate heat pumps, well, well there's, they can also go to air conditioning. And, uh, some people trivialize that or actually criticize that, but um, it's making me think there's a, a health benefit that I wasn't appreciating to having uh, a heat pump deliver both heat and cooling. So, um, so uh, committee, we're over a little bit into our break. Uh, any final questions for Mr. Allman? Right. So I'm not seeing any on our end. So thanks again for uh, coming back to the committee. I like your let's stay in touch. I, I'm guessing that we'll have more, more questions to ask downstream.